Hello to our friends joining us via recording. We are wrapping up our discussion of all things brain. Once we finish this discussion, we're going to take some time to do group work to review for our exam that is upcoming next Monday. So where we left off in our class time together earlier this week was talking about the reticular activating system. So when we talk about the reticular activating system, this is the system in our body that helps us uh, to be conscious, essentially. When you're thinking about, about RAS, which is how I abbreviate it, this is what helps you, in the words of medical notes, to say alert and oriented. So remember that we get a lot of kinds of sensory information that goes into the reticular activating system. We get information from things that we see. So for example, the sunlight helping us to know that, hey, it's still daytime, we should still be awake. We get information from what we hear. So for example, when you hear your, your alarm go off in the morning, it should wake you up, at least that's the goal. <laughs> And then we also get information uh, from things like touching or temperature or pain. Those things feed into this system to allow it to send information to the rest of your cerebrum, which if you remember from class on, on Monday, I said was kind of the part of your brain that makes you human. So the reticular activating system sends out little pings, kind of like, uh, like sonar does, where we send out little signals that bounce back that tell the cerebrum, hey, I think we might be getting some important information. Let's make sure that we're alert. We talked about though, the last thing we talked about on Monday was how there is one type of sensory information that does not feed into this system that's really important. What was that one kind of information we talked about on, on Monday that does not feed into this system? What do we not have talking to RAS? Yeah, exactly. Several of us mentioning in the chat what we do not have going into the reticular activating information or system is information related to smell. There's no smell information going into the system, which is why the connection we made was to smoke detectors. If you were awake, the first way that you would know that there's a fire is you would smell the smoke. By the time we could see the flames, by the time we could hear things popping or we feel the temperature of the flame to wake us up, that's not long enough to get out. So if we create some auditory impulses, if we create some visual impulses to get you awake and get you out of the house, that's what it's helpful for. So the reticular activating system makes you conscious and makes you alert. Let's talk about the opposite of the reticular activating system, and that is the pineal gland. So I'm gonna put a note here in the chat, the pineal gland is what we're gonna talk about next. Um, so Danae asked a clarifying question in the chat, I'll bounce back. Uh, she, she asked uh, if you would eventually smell the smoke. Um, so if you were to smell the smoke, you would, if you, to, perceive that you would have to be conscious. So you would smell the smoke um, perhaps after it's become very painful to breathe. Um, so you have smoke in your lungs, that pain wakes you up and then you would smell it. When we're sleeping, we don't detect smell sensations in the same way that we do as when we're awake. Um, yeah, and there's a clarifying question about the two different kinds of sleep. Uh, full disclosure, I, um, I don't know for sure how RAS plays into deep REM sleep versus uh, shortwave sleep or the kind of sleep that we first go into before it's deep sleep. Um, it would be, would be highly possible that RAS is kind of ramping down as we start to go into sleep and then when we're in REM sleep, um, it's completely turned off. Um, Although that's a very interesting question because now Dr. Aulis's wheels are turning in her head like, hmm, so how does this relate to dreaming? So that's a great question, Seth. I appreciate you asking that. Um, yeah, and yeah, and Danae is, is mentioning that the reason she asked about the smell is because of, of a situation that, uh, that her grandma went through where she didn't smell the smoke. And, and it's absolutely right that you would not smell the smoke from a fire unless you were conscious because that kind of information doesn't feed into the brain to wake you up. Once we're awake, we can absolutely activate. Uh, if you remember in class on Monday, we talked about 
the primary sensory area, so the primary olfactory area, would be what would would smell those those smoke smells. But it's turned off when you're sleeping because the cerebrum kind of, in, in many ways, will kind of power down what isn't needed when you're asleep. So yeah, great clarifying questions. I, uh, I don't know the answer to all of them, but I have this little plaque that I want to get uh, to put in my office that says everything is figure outable. Uh, we may not know everything, but we can figure it out. So I love that we're, uh, we're chatting about these things together. Uh, this is great. All right, so RAS keeps you awake. The pineal gland puts you to sleep. So we're at the time of the semester where I think we can probably all relate to, uh, to my friend right here, falling asleep in the middle of the day on top of your anatomy study stuff, right? Uh, how the pineal gland is supposed to work is that when it is time for you to sleep, the pineal gland is supposed to spit out extra melatonin to make you tired. So the pineal gland makes melatonin. As you are sleeping, when we get closer to time to wake up, the secretion of melatonin is supposed to go down. If we are chronically tired, uh, that may not happen. The melatonin may stick around a little bit longer than it's supposed to. So melatonin helps us to kind of calm down the reticular activating system and get some rest. We can have issues with the pineal gland, not only when it's the end of the semester and we're exhausted, uh, but also when we travel. So jet lag is a problem when your pineal gland is synced up to the time zone you used to be in, but it's not the time zone you're in now. So it's making a bunch of melatonin at times when you're trying to uh, trying to go to, to be awake or it's not making any when it's time to sleep. So one of the ways that we can actually treat jet, jet lag, excuse me, is called bright light therapy. And all bright light therapy is, is you literally sit in front of a bright light and look at how happy it makes you. Like she is so happy with that bright light. So I think that I need a bright light in my life. Uh, that with a little bit of coffee apparently will just solve all my problems. So bright light therapy, how it works uh, kind of on a deeper level is the wavelengths of light that are in this bright light mimic the wavelengths that are in sunlight. So when we expose our body to the sunlight, it tells our brain, oh, this is time to wake up. So that's why a lot of times when you travel, they say, hey, stay awake until it's bedtime in the, the time zone you end up in, because that'll help your pineal gland get back into order. Hey, by the way, uh, I'm sure you've heard all of the ranting and raving in popular culture about blue light coming from our devices. Um, it is actually a thing. So the wavelength of blue light that comes from our devices Way back in evolutionary times when we all lived in caves, uh, the only time that we encountered wavelengths that were that energetic, so we'll talk about light, it travels up and down in waves. Blue light, purple light, lots of energy. The only time we used to encounter that was when the sun was out. So now we have our personal devices that are putting out that kind of light and our brain evolutionarily says, oh, this is time to be awake. So that's the problem with uh, using devices right before bed is you're telling your pineal gland, actually, the sun's out still. I should still be awake. So it, it uh, may not be quite as activated because you're getting that kind of stimulation in there. So the pineal gland helps you to sleep. The reticular activating system keeps you awake. The pineal gland is part of, if you remember from lab, I'm going to type it in here. There's that thing in your packet uh, that I, I kind of clarified for you. We're not going to ask about it specifically, and that's the epithalamus. Uh, the pineal gland is the major part of the epithalamus. So we just talked about the epithalamus, the above part of the thalamus, or above the thalamus. Now we're briefly going to chat about the thalamus which was the middle part. If you remember from lab, we said this was the duck face in the middle of the brain. So the duck face, the thalamus, for, for the sake of what we're considering in lecture, this is a relay center. So for example, information comes in and your brain realizes this is uh, information 
related to something I'm touching with my fingers, the thalamus will send it there. Or this is information related to something I'm hearing, the thalamus will send it down to the temporal lobe. Or something I'm seeing, I'll send it over here. So think about the thalamus as, as kind of a conductor, sending information to where it's supposed to go in the brain. The other thing the thalamus does is it edits information. So a lot of the information that comes into your brain, you never actually consciously perceive it. So that's why as you're sitting at home on your computer browsing Facebook while Dr. Aulis is talking, you're not hearing anything that Dr. Aulis says, right? Now you are, maybe. <laughs> uh, when we talk about, about the thalamus being a filter, it decides what kinds of information are and are not important for you. So my favorite example to give of what the thalamus does uh, is it filters out the information that tells you that you're wearing pants. Although we're virtual today, right? So maybe you're not. <laughs> but the, the fact that you're wearing pants, that, that the pants or the shorts or the leggings are touching your skin, you're not consciously aware of that all the time because the thalamus says, hey, I, I don't need to know that. I've heard it once. I know that I'm wearing pants. I'm good. So filtering out information that you don't need to consciously process, that is, is a job of the thalamus. Uh, so... Seth asked a clarifying question if we would consider this a commissural tract. Uh, good connection to make, but the thalamus is actually made out of gray matter. So because of that, it's, it's less of a connection between, um, between different parts. It, it, it does do a little bit of processing to send stuff around. But yeah, great connection to make with the corpus callosum. Uh, it does, I believe it actually will send some of that information through the corpus callosum, which is that commissural tract. Uh, so Liza, are you questioning that some people may have come to virtual class without pants? Is that what your question is? <laughs> For the record, Dr. Aulis is on campus and I am definitely wearing pants. But hey, let, let's be real for a moment here. You know what I'm not doing is I am not wearing my shoes. I totally took my shoes off, not gonna lie. But that's the other example I give when we're in, uh, when we're in the lecture classroom. Um, I, I will, will mention, hey, you all are wearing shoes and you didn't notice that until now. Well, Dr. Aulis is not wearing her shoes. <laughs> Yes, but I am definitely wearing my, my pants for, for the sake of Liza and everyone in class. I would like it to be known that Dr. Aulis is definitely wearing pants to virtual class. You are free to wear whatever you'd like. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm throwing these back up. We did look at these before um, when we were talking about functional MRIs, just to show you the role of the thalamus in sending information to different places. Uh, so we talked about how you use way more of your brain when you're thinking than when you're speaking. But if we're using a bunch of different areas all at the same time, we have to be sending information throughout the place and, and bringing that information together. Uh, we talked a little bit about this in lab, not so much in lecture, but the frontal lobe of your brain is where you do processing and thinking and planning. So taking information, for example, from what you've felt like physically touched and, and uh, experienced, along with maybe things you're hearing and putting that together to figure out how to respond, the thalamus would be heavily involved in that, bringing information together to use different parts of your brain. So just a visual representation for you of how information goes to different places. In addition to those tracks, the association tracks, we'd use the thalamus to sort it out. All right, so we've talked about the cerebrum, which is what makes you human. We just talked about the thalamus and the epithalamus uh, that do things like sorting and um, melatonin secretion. Now we're gonna go down into the brain stem. And remember from the beginning of this lecture that the brain stem is um, where we do all of our basic life functions. Uh, specifically most involved in a lot of those basic life functions is the pons and the medulla. So we know from lab that the pons is important in setting our breathing rate. Uh, so it has a thing that you'll talk about in AMP2 called the pontine respiratory center. I'll go ahead and add that in here. Pontine respiratory center. 
the pontine respiratory center helps us to figure out um, when we're breathing in, breathing out, uh, how deeply we're breathing there with the pons. The medulla oblongata also helps us with, uh, with breathing. Um, so dictating some of those things like the length of breath or timing. Uh, but the other thing that, that the medulla is really important for is setting your heart rate. Uh, so the medullary rhythmicity center helps to determine how fast or slow your heart rate's going. And we can also thank the medulla for everyone's favorite reflexes. Uh, things like vomiting, coughing, sneezing. A lot of those types of reflexes come here from the medulla oblongata. You have a question, a stop and think it through in your, your outline uh, that asks you, hey, if someone's in a coma, what things would be working, what things wouldn't be working? When we're considering that question, um, I, I think I mentioned it on Monday, maybe not. Um, when someone's in a coma, what is the major thing that has stopped working? Do we remember what specifically gets gets damaged that that puts us into a coma? Yeah, exactly. A couple of us are chiming in. Big picture when you're thinking about a coma. At the most basic level, what it is, is it's a problem with RAS. The reticular activating system is damaged. For some reason, it won't turn back on to make the cerebrum come awake. So the cerebrum, again, is where you process things, where we hear things, understand things, where we decide to move or speak. If RAS is broken, I can't do those things. But if RAS is broken, I can still do the kinds of things that the brainstem does. So when you're considering a patient in a coma, it's possible that they can still breathe. It's possible that their heart is still beating all on its own because those are things that come from the brainstem, a part of your brain that will always be active until we literally are no longer alive. Um, so the reticular activating system turns on the cerebrum and all of its parts, but the brainstem works on its own without, without the RAS system kicking it into gear. Uh, yeah, so Danae asked a very interesting question. I get this question a lot is if you're in a coma, can you hear things or can you not hear things um, or can you hear them and not process them? Uh, and that's an excellent question. Um, I've heard mixed stories about that uh, because sometimes you hear about someone that's been in a coma for 15 years and when they wake up, they say, I heard everything. I remember it all. Uh, and then you have some people who are in a coma that that don't remember anything at all. Um, I suspect it would have to do with how much your reticular activating system has turned off. So how much it, it is or isn't activating certain areas. Generally, when we're thinking about a person being in a coma, a lot of of what we're looking at to determine if they're in a, in a coma is the functionality of their frontal lobe. So can they communicate with me? Can they move their body? Can they do those kinds of things? It would be possible, yeah, like, like Seth kind of mentioned, it'd be possible maybe it's just the frontal lobe that is not, not functioning, that RAS isn't talking to, but maybe the temporal lobe still is, uh, or maybe the parietal lobe still is, so they're still feeling things, uh, or maybe they're potentially collecting some visual information. But if the frontal lobe is shut off, they wouldn't have the ability to communicate, the ability to process, to, to move. Um, so in a situation like that, I would suspect that some parts of the brain are still working, but the frontal lobe would not be. And that's why we're, we're perceiving them as being in a coma. But yeah, I, like I said, I, I hear mixed stories as to whether or not people hear you. Some people definitely do. When they come out of their coma, they tell us that. So um, very interesting uh, application of, of RAS and a coma, how that might work. The last thing I want to briefly chat with you about is blood supply to the brain and how that relates to uh, cerebrospinal fluid, which we talked about in lab. Uh, 
When we look at the brain, the brain has blood supply primarily on the outside of it. Uh, it takes a lot of blood to keep your brain alive and keep it functional. There are two things that blood has inside of it that all the cells in your body need. Can you help me out in the chat? What might those things be that, that are in the bloodstream that go everywhere in your body to, to keep your cells alive? What do they need? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the first thing they need for sure is oxygen. And the second thing, when we're talking about the brain, um, what my neurons need, if you remember, the only food my neurons will eat is glucose. So my neurons need glucose uh, that comes through the bloodstream. They need oxygen that comes through the bloodstream. When a person um, has a stroke, for example, or they have a heart attack and we're having trouble getting blood up to the brain, the issue is we only have like a three to five minute window where my neurons have enough oxygen or glucose to survive. When we get beyond that window, neurons start to die. So in a stroke, it'd be like if I cut this blood vessel right here or I put a stopper in it, I put a clot in it, all of my neurons that got blood from this blood vessel would no longer be getting it. So they wouldn't have oxygen, they wouldn't have nutrients, they, they wouldn't be able to keep doing their functions. So blood, very important to your body. About 20% of all the blood that comes out of your heart in every single heartbeat goes up to your brain. Your brain is not one fifth of your body, but it takes so much oxygen and nutrients to function. So we have a lot of blood supply there. But hey, most of the blood vessels that are up there are a type of blood vessel that we talked about way back in lesson number one. We talked about the kind of blood vessel that would not let things leak to make sure that uh, no bacteria or viruses get into your brain. Do we happen to remember what we called the kind of blood vessel that did not leak? Which kind of blood vessels do not, uh, do not leak? Exactly, yep. When we talk about blood vessels that don't leak, they're called continuous capillaries. And we call them continuous capillaries. So we're looking at, here in the middle is a blood vessel. We're looking at a blood vessel in the brain, not only the yellow part, that's part of the blood vessel itself, not only is that a big solid line, there's no holes, but in the brain, we also put a layer of connective tissue around it to make sure that, that nothing leaks out. When I ask you, because I will ask you on the homework and on exam number three, what can and cannot cross what we call the blood brain barrier. So all these layers of connective tissue and cells that separate the bloodstream from the brain. When I ask you about what can and cannot go through the blood brain barrier, it's exactly the same as what can and cannot get through the plasma membrane of a cell. When you think about uh, the blood brain barrier, it's basically just plasma membranes. It's, it's extra layers of plasma membranes. So when we talked about things uh, like oxygen, or when we talked about things like carbon dioxide, these were things that shared their electrons equally. Hey, if we share our electrons equally, what word do I use to describe that? I share my electrons equally so I don't have any dipoles. There's my other hint with that. Yeah, exactly. When we're thinking about things that I share equally or things that could pass straight through the plasma membrane, that's things that are nonpolar. Another word that we use for things that are nonpolar we said that they were lipid soluble or they're fat soluble. That's the same thing. Those kinds of things can get straight across the blood brain barrier because they match the plasma membranes. 
some things that can't get straight across the plasma membrane, things that have a positive or a negative charge. So ions can't just go in and out of, of the blood brain barrier. They're stuck in the blood. We, we don't have those going in and out. Things that are really big, we don't have space for those to, to get in and out. So they, they cannot leave the blood vessel to go in. When we're talking about things uh, like glucose, which is not nonpolar, glucose is actually polar. What I will do is use a transport protein. So remember we talked about things like channel proteins or things like active transport, so carrier proteins. I could use that for glucose. I could use that for any polar or charged amino acids. So if you're not nonpolar, if you're not fat soluble, I'm going to have to use a protein to get you out of the bloodstream and into the brain, just like I had to do when we were talking about getting things across the membrane. So when you look at questions about the blood brain barrier, again, just remember it's, it's basically two plasma membranes that are squeezed together. If I can get across the plasma membrane, I can, can get across the blood brain barrier. By the way, the blood brain barrier is problematic uh, in medicine. If someone has an infection in their brain, uh, we cannot give antibiotics that, that would travel through the bloodstream because they won't get across the blood brain barrier. So uh, antibiotics, antifungals, antivirals, if we're trying to get something into the brain tissue itself, we cannot just use the bloodstream for that. Uh, we're more likely to have to put it actually into, uh, if you remember from lab, the thing called the subarachnoid space, where it, it's the meninges that go from the spinal cord up to the brain. To get things to the brain, I have to find a creative way to get past that blood-brain barrier. So the blood-brain barrier is continuous capillaries. The other kind of blood vessels that we have in the brain are those things from lab that we talked about called the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus is not continuous capillaries. These are actually leaky blood vessels that we find in the brain. The reason we want them to leak is because this is how I make cerebrospinal fluid. So as the plasma leaks out of the blood vessels, I've got these cells that we mentioned in lab called ependymal cells that filter the stuff that leaks out. So anything that shouldn't be getting into the brain will go back into this blood vessel to go to the spleen to get processed. But as long as we have things like glucose or oxygen, some of these vitamins and ions, we'll keep those, we'll let those go into the cerebrospinal fluid, but not the stuff that we don't want in the brain. That being said, if you have a brain infection, somehow there's fungus or a virus that's in your nervous system tissue inside the brain, this is where it came from. It came from those leaky blood vessels, the choroid plexus. It didn't come from places with the blood brain barrier because that wouldn't be able to get through. But at the choroid plexus, because it's leaky, that would be the best shot for stuff to get into your brain. When we talk about making cerebrospinal fluid, it has oxygen, it has nutrients, and the other thing that it does for your brain is it makes it physically lighter. So it's kind of like when you're in a swimming pool and you float, your brain is actually floating inside the fluid as well. Uh, we mentioned already in lab the different places where the fluid goes. So a quick reminder for you that we start with those big lateral ventricles that are in my two cerebral hemispheres. We use that thing called the interventricular foramen to make stuff leave the lateral ventricles into that big third ventricle, down through the cerebral aqueduct, and into that fourth ventricle which from there, like we saw in lab this week, or we will see in lab this week, goes down into the central canal in the spinal cord or out into this space where I'm gonna recycle it when I'm done with it. So we have choroid plexus, you can see them here in red. We have choroid plexus in all four of my ventricles. I'm constantly making cerebrospinal fluid in all of these places. And I should also be constantly draining it out of all of these places either into the subarachnoid space or down into the spinal cord 
If I am not draining it like I should be, I can develop a condition called hydrocephalus. Put that in the chat for us. Hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus literally means water on the brain, but this is not a water problem. This is a problem with cerebrospinal fluid. So in hydrocephalus, cerebrospinal fluid builds up inside the ventricles. When we talk about uh, a skull, the skull of a baby or a toddler, there's something that, that babies and very young children have that make it, as we can see in this picture, for there to be room for expansion for that extra fluid. Do we remember what we had in the fetal skull or in a baby skull that allows it to expand like we see here with all that fluid pressing, pressing it out? Yeah, exactly. Several of us commenting in the chat that remember that the, that the baby skull or the fetal skull has fontanelles. Fontanelles are the ones that are made out of protein fibers. So the protein fibers allow us to have a little bit of stretching and a little bit of growing space. So hydrocephalus, 100%, we would treat it in a, an infant, in a toddler. We can treat it by uh, creating a shunt, which is a tube that'll go from the ventricle, usually down into the abdominal pelvic cavity. That's typically how we treat it. It's dangerous, but very treatable in, in babies and toddlers. It's often fatal in adults. Almost all the time it's fatal in adults. Why would hydrocephalus be fatal in adults? What's different about the adult skull compared to the fetal skull or to a toddler skull? Yeah, so Adriana is talking about the pressure. Yeah, we have no room uh, for things to stretch anymore, right? We built those things called sutures where we locked together the bones. And remember that sutures have no wiggle room. They don't go anywhere. So in the adult skull, if we start to have too much uh, cerebrospinal fluid building up inside our ventricles, literally we're going to squish our brain tissue against our skull, which will not expand for us. So, uh, must be caught very early in adults so that we can start that drainage right away. As long as we can get the relieve the pressure, as long as we have an outlet for the fluid, it is okay. But there's not any wiggle room in, in our diagnosis period because adult brains don't have any space for that fluid to build up. That pressure has nowhere to go. So hydrocephalus, uh, a problem with cerebrospinal fluid, and we see the differences in adults versus babies because of those fontanelles. Yeah, so uh, Seth asked a question about treating uh, hydrocephalus in adults. Uh, yes, they sometimes, depending on how severe it is, we may need to just drill a hole to get that fluid out right away. Um, with that hole, um, we would either then potentially use that hole or find a, um, less maybe obvious um, way to drain the fluid. Uh, a lot of times they'll take a little tube, like I mentioned, called a shunt, uh, and embed that in the brain and then run it down under the skin of the neck down into that abdominal pelvic cavity. But if we are in a, a hydrocephalus crisis, if you will, where there's so much pressure, um, absolutely. We will drill a hole just to get that fluid out and then we'll figure out a more long-term solution. Uh, that doesn't expose our brain to the environment, right? That that would be problematic. <laughs> Any other questions about the things that we covered here with the brain today or what we covered on Monday? Or shoot me a, a thumbs up or some other emoji to let me know that you're you're tracking with me. Awesome. 
Uh, Liza asked about the number uh, of milliliters on the cerebrospinal fluid. I know that's in the guided lesson. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to quote it wrong. For some reason, 150 to 200 sounds right to me, uh, but it has been a little while, full disclosure, since I looked into that number. I don't know if anyone caught that from the guided lesson. How many milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid do we have? Did we catch that? To, to be to be real with you, I, I promise I won't ask you for the volume when we're OK. So yeah, so Caitlin said 125 to 500 overall, and we make about 150 per day. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that sounds about right, Seth. Uh, whatever the guided lesson said is absolutely correct. I like I mentioned, I, I haven't reviewed the volumes and I promise I'm not going to ask you <laughs> when we when we take our exam on Monday. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording and then we're going to chat about our review work.